Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the module 5 part 1. Today we will discuss about language acquisition. So, let us take a quick look at the journey so far kind of a recap. So, till now we have seen that language in both its structural as well as functional domains is inextricably related to the neurocognitive as well as socio-cultural aspects of human experience. So, not only is language connected to the mechanisms within the brain, within the cognitive apparatus, but also it is informed and it is in a constant interaction with the socio-cultural environment, the input from the outside of the, of the human uh, body. So, there is a mixture of uh, various factors that give rise to what we see uh, in terms of language output. So, we have seen that through various um, aspects of language starting with the category formation process and how it is expressed in language, the framing of an experience and then um, schemas and metaphors and metonymy and so on and so forth, various experiences of human life and how they are closely connected to the fundamental aspects of human cognition which is then revealed through language. So, this is what we have seen till now. Now, let us turn to yet another very interesting angle of language which is that of learning. How does language learning take place? So, in this uh, segment we will look at a few important points in this domain. So, we will start with language acquisition in children. Typically, uh, when we are talking about language acquisition in children, we will be referring to first language acquisition. So, within first language acquisition, there are various standpoints theoretically, uh, some of them are um, belong to one category of theories, some of them belong to another category of theories and ultimately more or less it all uh, we can categorize them that the various theoretical positions can be categorized either belonging to the nature or the nurture part of the nature nurture debate. So, uh, while talking about these theories, we will uh, look at only few of the um, scholars will be able to look at, but uh, the most important ones among them will be Skinner, Chomsky, Luria, Vygotsky, Pia, um, Piaget, Sellers, Bandura, Brunner and so on. And then we will be uh, talking about language acquisition in terms of social cognition. And of course, there are very um, two very important concepts as far as language acquisition is uh, concerned, the uh, notion of critical period hypothesis and the idea of the theory of mind. So, theory of mind and its role in language development in terms of both typical and atypical children will also be covered uh, in short. And then we will move on to uh, the role of joint attention as in how attentional mechanism uh, in terms of joint attention in case of children shape the way language uh, acquisition uh, takes place. And then we will conclude with some of the recent latest developments in this domain as to where research is today as we speak. This is the road map we will follow. Now, first language acquisition. Children learn language under normal circumstances. This is not, this is a no brainer. Every, every uh, normally developing child learns to speak and masters language within a very short period of time. So, uh, it is understood that this capacity to learn language is innate, humans are born with the capacity to speak. Of course, uh, as we have seen in the introductory lectures that uh, language uh, may not be 
entirely exclusively human, but largely the complexities of uh, various kinds of you know language manipulation with respect to various other factors might be uh, human. So, this is a capacity that is understood to be a, a very important part of human uh, being human, if not exclusively uh, be uh, an exclusive criteria. So, but the type of language that one will speak is not predecided, it depends on the kind of circumstances one is born into. And there are stages of development, uh, starts with you know um, babbling, cooing and one word stage to two word stage and so on and so forth, there are stages of development that is also um, universal, almost universal there are children everywhere speak, learn to speak in the same way. However, it is, it, it is uh, on the surface a very simple affair, every child learns to speak, normally speaking. Under normal circumstances, every child learns to speak and that too remarkably fast. But that is exactly where the question is, how is it that a very complex phenomena of language, a complex phenomena of the understanding of the rules of language as well as, as in the structural rules of language as well as the usage of the same um, uh, tool how is it that it is done, it is, it is mastered in a such a remarkably short span of time. Now, compare this, compare language um, uh, learning with respect to any other complex learning mechanism, for example, mathematics. Children master mathematics at a much, much later stage as opposed to language. So, that is what, language is a complex phenomenon, it is not a simple thing. It, uh, though it is, it appears simple, but we have already seen through various um, aspects of it that it is not simple at all. There are so many layers to it, there are so many uh, interactions to master and so on and so forth. So, how is it, how is it done? So, that is where the primary um, uh, debate has always been, primary um, uh, scientific inquiry has been as to how children do what they do with respect to language children master language at a very remarkably fast pace. By the age 5 or uh, 5, they are fluent speakers of whatever language they are born into. So, that is where the um, a large number of theoretical standpoints have um, come into being and there are the linguists and, um, and psychologists, most notably psychologists, most of uh, the story, um, theories have come from psychology and also uh, from linguistics to, to try and find out what is the underlying mechanism that makes children master language even when the, uh, the other complex mechanisms do not seem to be doing so well with children, it takes much longer time. For example, mathematics. So, before we go into the details of each of these um, uh, 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 stalwarts who talked about and who have given us theoretical understanding as to how this probably happens. Let us just look at, uh, let us try to kind of box them into uh, types of theories. So, on the, uh, at, the be, at, the, at the beginning we will talk about the behaviorism, the theory of behaviorism. We have already dis, uh, discussed about behaviorism in the, in the introductory part. Behaviorism war, was one of the most important, most um, uh, influential theoretical standpoint in psychology till 1950s, uh, 60s or so, which believed that the human behavior is what we need to study and that behavioral output is a result of an input system. So, there is a stimulus response sort of a loop that is at the core of various um, learning processes of humans and that included language. So, language is taught, language is taught by the teachers, by the parents, by any other caregiver and so on and so forth. So, uh, within this larger um, umbrella term, we will discuss about Skinner, uh, B. F. Skinner, the most uh, well known of them and of, of course, um, Albert Bandura. And then we will move on to nativist, uh, nativist theory of language, which um, primarily owes its existence to Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, who, um, who opined that children are born with a language learning faculty, the language acquisition device, which he called language acquisition device in the beginning, later on he called it universal grammar. So, we are all hardwired to learn language, it cannot be taught to us. The environment uh, may be a supplementary um, input, but environment does not teach us to speak, we are already predecided, uh, predetermined to be able to speak, the mechanism, the grammar is already there. And then uh, we will move on to talk about constructivists. 
So, language learning in uh, uh, as per them is a part of cognitive general cognitive mechanism and language learning is constructed through interaction, interaction with various of various types. So, here we will discuss Luria, Piaget, Vygotsky, Brunner and so on. So, let us start with behaviorism as we have just said that B. F. Skinner was one of the uh, most well known among the behaviorist um, theories, theorists and who talked about language in terms of uh, stimulus response system. So, he says that language can be taught, children are taught to speak by the primary caregivers, by the people around them, the teachers, the parents and so on. So, we teach children the say this and the child says that and then when, so this is a stimulus response, the stimulus is given by the teacher, the child gives the response and then there is also a feedback loop. So, if the child does uh, correctly, if the response is correct with respect to the stimulus, there is a positive reinforcement, the child is encouraged, child is rewarded in some sense, child is you know um, praised. Uh, and so on. So, these are positive reinforcements. So, the child understands that this is how it is to be done and then if there is a wrong response to the stimulus, then there is a negative reinforcement, the correction, the teacher will correct the child and then gradually child will learn not to utter that. So, basically this is a imitation a kind of a uh, imitation process that the child um, goes through. So, language learning as a result of this is like any other skill, any other um, skill that is learned through observation, imitation, repetition, errors, rewards and punishments. So, this is the this is the entire uh, frame within which language learning takes place as per the behaviorist theories. So, the child will observe, imitate and then there is a uh, repetition that the child will uh, make and if there is a uh, correct repetition, he, he or she gets praised, if, if it is wrong then he or she gets punished and then the cycle goes on and this is how language is learned. Skinner called it operant conditioning. So, this kind of conditioning is at the root of um, uh, the root of language learning. Uh, also here we, uh, we can also mention Pavlov, the classical conditioning, uh, all of us know about the Pavlov's uh, experiment on the dog that uh, there is a, a particular time when the bell rings and the dog gets food and over a period of time even in, uh, uh, even in absence of food, the dog still salivates when the uh, bell rings. So, that is uh, another kind of conditioning. So, Conditioning is a, an important aspect of behaviorism um, and in terms of language learning, this is how the loop really works. So, habit formation and imitation method of second language acquisition also is part of this. So, in, uh, while teaching second language, the same kind of methodology is um, uh, used in the teaching material to create a habit. As we have seen that habit formation and imitation is the fundamental rule. So, the same thing if you take to second language acquisition, this uh, basic idea has been imported there as well in the in terms of audio lingual method of language teaching. Yet another um, uh, important uh, scholar is Albert Bandura. Who, uh, who also largely speaking. Now, when we say that both Skinner and Bandura can be understood as behaviorists, the, uh, we must remember the one thing that they do not really agree on every point, on every aspect of uh, this uh, methodology. There are, there are uh, uh, finer differences, there are finer nuances within each of them, but largely uh, they, can be, uh, they can be considered to be uh, part of behaviorist uh, the theory, be behaviorist agenda so to say. So, Bandura also believed that children can acquire language through vicarious learning which is also it is um, his most famous theory is that of social learning theory which is the same thing. So, social learning theory is um, quite similar to Skinner's behaviorist theory because it, it talks about reward and punishment. So, there is uh, an output by the child, child and then there is a reward and which means that it, this behavior gets reinforced and if there is a punishment the behavior does not get to uh, get reinforced. So, though his theory is similar with um, behaviorist theory of learning, however, Bandura makes a very significant contribution here and in terms of um, uh, there is a slight difference between him and uh, Skinner because Bandura talks about cognitive uh, conditioning, cog cognitive uh, processes. He includes cognitive processes as part of the language learning mechanism. 
and he makes it um, very clear that internal brain mechanisms, internal mental mechanism, cognitive mechanisms are at the root of language learning um, uh, features, language learning mechanisms that the children put into practice. So, he added along with uh, previously existing classical conditioning and operant conditioning, he added two more uh, processes, he called them mediating process and observational learning to the uh, existing, uh, existing two uh, types of conditioning. So, basically there is a mediation and there is also an observational learning which means that the person, the person, the learner is given some amount of autonomy, which is where one important uh, dif uh, difference between him and Skinner lies. Skinner do does not give any autonomy to the learner, it is kind of a stimulus response system entirely governed by the um, uh, teaching method. But he firmly believes, Bandura firmly believes that uh, social learning is an very, very, uh, is a very, very important criteria and says that it has forced, it is a four stage process, it has uh, and he names them attention, retention, motor reproduction and motivation. This is how it can be uh, reproduced. So, uh, these are the four stages of learning language as per Bandura is concerned. So, you may notice that there is attention is one important aspect here, which as we will see as we move on that many, many theorists, many um, cognitive psychologists, neuroscientists and linguists have agreed on this aspect that attention plays an extremely important role in learning language as in as it does in all other language uh, processing mechanisms. So, observes the child, the learner observes others behavior, pays attention, observing means you pay attention. So, that is when you observe. So, paying attention and then they, the, the child retains those information that is important for future reference and then of course, the motor reproduction as in the output and then motivation. So, this is where the motivation part is where Bandura and uh, Skinner agree. However, in the in terms of the cognitive representation, there is a slight difference. So, that is about behaviorism. Now, we will talk about Noam Chomsky, the uh, towering figure of uh, modern linguistics. So, Chomsky is credited with the creation of this um, generative school of linguistics. Chomsky's criticism, scathing attack on B. F. Skinner basically was one of the major reasons of uh, behind the gradual uh, disappearance of behaviorism to a large extent, as we have seen in the introductory lecture along with Lashley and others. So, Chomsky attacked the behaviorist theory by saying that there is something called a poverty of stimulus. One cannot possibly it is not humanly possible to teach the children all the possible utterances in a particular language. The child that grows up by the time uh, of it is at, at in 5 years of age, the child starts speaking, the child starts producing sentences that it has never heard of. So, if language is entirely dependent on stimulus and response system, how does it, how, how does a child produce sentences that it has never heard of? How does it create complex sentences? How does it give, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce sentences that are, in, you know, in formulations that, that they have never been taught explicitly? So, that cannot be stimulus response system as a result of which is a, um, uh, cannot, cannot explain how children are capable of doing that. And we all know that it is true, children are capable of, how often you will see, you, uh, we will be astonished as, you know, when the child is beginning to speak, one fine day the child comes up with a very complex sentence, uh, with a very, uh, you know, interesting formulation, sentence formulation, syntactic uh, structure which we uh, nobody or none of us would have ever uh, spoken to him or her. So, there are this kind of um, the, the he, he pointed out various such um, uh, uh, problems with the Skinner's th theory and he brought in the idea that it is innate, you cannot teach. All we can do is there are certain stimulus in the in the environment that are probably important, but not as important as the innate ability of the child to learn and speak language. So that there is an in uh, you know an universal grammar that all of us are, our brains are embedded with. So there is a structure, there is an algorithm that makes us learn language, no, not somebody teaching us. This is the primary understanding of uh, Chomsky's innateness hypothesis. So, and this particular uh, mechanism that what he called LAD in the beginning and later on universal grammar is that this is responsible for language learning, nothing else. 
and he also made a very important um, observation, very important uh, standpoint in terms of language functions that lang it is modular in nature, meaning that the brain, uh, the, the, that aspect of language mechanism in the brain is insulated from other mental functions. It does not have to depend on any other mental or cognitive functions in order to be useful. So, language uh, function is complete in itself, it has a modular structure. So, these are the two important, most important contributions of Chomsky in terms of language learning. So, innateness hypothesis that children are born with the capacity and therefore, they will anyway speak um, with or without teaching. And secondly, language is modular, it does not depend on any other mental mechanism. And he also gave primary importance to syntax, sentence structure, not meaning, meaning was not uh, really useful as far as Chomsky is concerned. Similarly, we also have sellers uh, who is again there are differences between them, they are not exact, uh, uh, they do not talk about the same things, but largely sellers also um, believes in Chomsky's innateness hypothesis. However, he has his own, um, uh, own way of presenting it. So, he says that there is a prior abstract knowledge before the acquisition of language, this is uh, where that, that is where the innateness hypothesis uh, comes in. Sellers compares language to games in which thoughts, assertions, etcetera are positions and communication, interaction, intelligibility, etcetera are the goal. So, it is like a game, language is like a game where there are there is an interaction of various kinds between these two um, segments. So, what is important according to sellers is how we learn to move from one position to another. So, he suggests that the distinction between pattern governed and rule governed behavior. A competent language user without intention exhibits pattern governed behavior, that is what he says. Whereas, a beginner language game player initially will recognize the rules in the linguistic pattern and gradually becomes competent as he understands, as he, as he acquires a clear understanding of the uh, game, uh, of the rules, and so on. So, Sellers and uh, Chomsky both agree on the innateness aspect of it, but Sellers gives a different, uh, slightly different take on this in terms of uh, language being like a game, where there is a difference between pattern um, uh, and pattern understanding and rule understanding. Now, we come to the constructivists. The constructivists are those psychologists, uh, is primarily a group of psychologists who have talked about how language is um, learned and what are the mechanisms in terms of a kind of a construction theory. So, the primary understanding of this uh, standpoint is that the knowledge resides in the human mind, knowledge is there. So, this is understood to be a cognitive mechanism, knowledge is there in the brain, it, but it is constructed. We are not, we do not come prepared with the, all the rules and everything in place, it is not like we are not a finished product. Human beings have their brains where knowledge is stored, where knowledge originates. However, that knowledge is constructed, it is a, uh, it is a process, it is not a given. So, it is neither innate nor it is passively absorbed. So, innate, uh, it, uh, when we talk about innateness, of course, we go back to Chomsky and his followers and if we talk about, you know, passively, a passive absorption of knowledge, we talk about the behaviorists. So, cognitive, uh, constructivists uh, differ from both of these in the sense that they talk about knowledge being constructed by the agent himself, agent as in the human being the learner, the person who is uh, constructing knowledge. So, the learner has an active role in this particular uh, theoretical understanding. The learner gradually builds up knowledge upon the foundation of previous experience. So, as we go on and on, we uh, the first experience we gain some knowledge, keep it stored, there is a, another set of experience, we match them and then build up on that, uh, you know, uh, build up on that understanding on the uh, uh, as we have from the previous experience and so on and on. So, it is a gradual process, it is a continuous process where the learner has an active role to play. The psychologists supporting constructivism believe that con cognitive development takes place in tandem with the agent's reaction with the world, whether it is the natural world or the socio-cognitive, socio-cultural world and so on and so forth. So, there are slight differences among them as well as we will see. So, uh, 
though not many actually consider uh, Luria as among the constructivists, but we will uh, still include him in this uh, in this uh, group because he also talks about how the understanding of a child of uh, the children's understanding of various kinds of skills also depend on many other factors. So, it is something that uh, you know there are mental mechanisms through which the child functions and as a result of which it is also part of you know constructing knowledge. So, that is why we have included uh, Alexander Luria here. So, he was a German neuropsychologist. In fact, Alexander Luria is considered the father of modern neuropsychology and um, a large part of his work was the result of his um, uh, duty as as a, as a doctor you know, for his treatment of the uh, injured soldiers of uh, second world war so the, a lot of soldiers who were uh, who had brain injury uh, he was treating them and this is when he realized he was this is when he actually uh, did a lot of his uh, studies on how the brain functions and brain regions and the experiences and the interaction between them actually work out. So, his functional organization of the brain is one of his major contribution to neuropsychology and uh, where he showed that there is a dynamic reaction between uh, interaction between um, experience and the brain structure which is something that is taken as a given today, but during Luria's time it was not. So, that is where his contribution makes a lot of um, sense. So, psychology of uh, in terms of language, in, ter in terms of psychology of language, he talked about, he studied about um, the functions and dysfunctions in terms of language. And his, uh, he has uh, in fact give his contribution is immense in terms of finding out various kinds of aphasia. So, he gives a long list of aphasia of various types and in terms of sensory, semantic and motor aphasia. But what we are interested here in this particular segment, we are not talking about aphasia uh, as of now. So, we are talking, we will be talking about the cognitive processes, the model of cognitive process that Luria gave us. So, he says that language and in general um, psychological processes are represent brain functional systems. So, what we see the output, the language or any other mental function is basically a result of the functional system in the brain, in the, in the physical brain. So, brain areas, various brain areas work together to any um, for any particular function to be carried out including language. So, this is an important observation. Of course, again today we know it as a as a uh, as almost like a common sense, but at that time this was not uh, so commonly understood. So, he says that brain different brain regions, different neuronal networks come together to carry out one simple one single uh, function mental function. It can be language, it can be any other function. And he gives these um, these types of uh, this is a structure that attention, arousal, motivation, planning and processing as the finer aspects of that process. So, there is uh, that there is this you know the various nodes of a particular process that attention, attention is like when you um, this is actually uh, this model uh, was of course, not given by Luria, but it is uh, based on his understanding. It came out um, uh, slightly later by Naglieri and Das. Uh, he, they created the pass model. This is the so pass model basically refers to planning, attention, simultaneous and successive processing as to how, what is the core of mental mechanism, what is the core of any, ki any kind of um, psychological process, be it language, be it anything else. You need to have certain, you know, the segmentation is like this. So, one, the first and foremost is paying attention. Remember, Bandura also retains this. Bandura is a later uh, psychologist. So, he also retains the attention attention part. So, attention paying attention is the first important most important basic understanding um, uh, basic uh, uh, basic um, ingredient for any kind of process to be initiated. So, first to pay attention what is it and then there is an arousal as in what to do with it and then of course, there is a motivation and planning and processing. So, based on Luria's idea uh, past model of cognitive assessment was created later uh, during his lifetime, but by um, some of his followers. So, this is how the past model looks. This is from um, this the credit goes to Naglieri and thus. So, the stages are like this. So, there is an input, input from the sensory organs and then there is a processing where you have sorting, analyzing and interpreting and then there is an output which is the behavior of any kind of action. 
and arousal basically refers to the mind getting alert as to asking for asking what is it, what is it that has to be done. So, it is questioning the input and then attention of course, it is orienting attention to, um, to the same thing and uh, surveys the um, it, and it surveys what is what has come in just now from the sensory uh, input. And then lexical ambiguities can be processed simultaneously, whereas syntactic ambiguity of deep structure and surface structure can be understood as successive processes. Remember past models uh, simultaneous and successive uh, processes. So, there are so there is input, there is a processing with respect to arousal and attention and then there is a um, uh, processes either it is simultaneous. So, in terms of language function, some language functions can be considered simultaneous like for example, lexical ambiguity, um, the, uh, uh, lexical ambiguity understanding and syntactic ambiguity in terms of deep and surface structure is considered to be successive. So, basically this is what um, uh, this is what Luria talks about in terms of language function. So, uh, this structure remains same some of the aspects may be highlighted in case of language or some other aspects can be highlighted for any other kind of mental mechanism, but the structure the thematic structure remains the same. So, he, uh, he studied he actually studied um, arousal motivation and dialogue in spontaneous speech to arrive at what is understood to be automatic verbal behavior. So, what we see as an automatic verbal behavior has you know in the, in the background this kind of processes which he actually studied. And, and uh, he also uh, teamed up with Vygotsky and uh, carried out a lot of work on social cultural um, influences in language as well. Um, however, after, after uh, Vygotsky uh, moved on, he, he concentrated on other areas due to also there were some other problems. So, anyway, so through these investigations, he arrived at the conclusion that language cannot be studied independently, but must be tied to understanding cognition. That is exactly why we are talking about Luria. Even though he has not been um, called a constructivist as such, he is one of the first uh, 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 psychologists, neuropsychologists to talk about language in terms of other mental functions. Remember Chomsky does not agree, Chomsky says language function is complete in itself. However, Luria going back to Luria, he says that language cannot simply be understood in terms of um, it, it itself alone it has to be understood. So, basically that is where the attention and the planning these are not language, these are not language dependent functions, these are other mental functions like psychological functions, cognitive functions that are not non linguistic in nature, but the lang in order to in order to give us what is considered automatic verbal output, we need the help of these kinds of various other mental mechanisms. Also, we need to look at the input system, input as in from the sensory inputs, whether it is visual or auditory or you know uh, tactile or whatever, all these kinds of input information is also important, and then we need to collaborate with the output mechanism, sensory motor mechanism in order to have an output. So, those things need to be uh, taken to together if we have to look at and uh, if we have to really understand how language function works. So, that is why that is what Luria talked about. And then we move on to um, yet another um, towering figure Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget was a, a child psychologist and he stressed that language learning was an in, is an integral part of cognitive development. So, you see the similarity and it is linked to biological maturation. This is a very significant contribution of Piaget. He talks about that as a child matures biologically through stages of life, cognitive development also follows and then language also figures in uh, features in one uh, part of that uh, during that developmental stage. So, there are these four stages um, that uh, Piaget talked about that is sensory motor stage from birth to two years of age and then pre operational stage 2 to 7 years and then it goes on like this. So, in the first stage mental representation and schemas are formed. We did talk about Piaget when we talked about image schemas that children when very small children infants in fact, when they interact with the world the physical world they their repeated experiences do give rise to certain schematic understanding of the world. So, there is a thought process that is getting prepared that is getting you know concretized at, at that stage when the child interacts with the physical world and 
forming those schemas of experiences. So, the child understands the world, understands the experiences through different kinds of schematic representation that has already the, that we already have experimental evidence now. And language starts to appear at the end of the first stage. So, uh, all of us know that children by the time they are two, uh, two years of age, they are they they are already in a, in one or one or two word stages. They are already speaking. So this is when the child realizes that words can be used to represent those objects and feelings. So till now it was pre-linguistic stage, pre-verbal stage. It was only in terms of the schematic representation. At the age of two onward, that representation gets a voice, so to say. It gets a label in terms of language. So language now represents those very schematic understanding that the child was already creating. So thought in this case precedes language as far as Piaget is concerned. So in this stage a child starts thinking, but the thought is egocentric. It is driven by self gain. That is what as far as uh, Piaget goes. Thus according to Piaget mental development occurs before language development. A, a particular amount of mental development, cognitive development is already in place before the child starts to speak. He does not uh, uh, um, uh, highlight the socio-cultural and environmental setting too much and um, because thought is already thought precedes language, so language does not really um, um, influence thought as far as Piaget is concerned. So, uh, according to Piaget language is driven by thought and mental development precedes language development. This is uh, in a nutshell what Jean Piaget talked about in terms of language development. So, the, the schematic uh, structure is already there, thought processes are already uh, quite uh, to a large extent there and then the child starts to learn language when it is time. Now, uh, Vygotsky on the other hand, Le Vygotsky based his theory on constructivist learning, constructivist learning theory and put emphasis on culture and environment to a large extent. He stressed the importance of social environment in understanding human interaction because the, the language is not spoken in a vacuum that we have already seen. So, language is situated within a socio-cultural environment and this is how the child learns that this is, how this is how the child's language development really takes place with a significant amount of input from the environment. A child's development appears on two planes as far as um, Vygotsky is concerned, social and psychological plane. And there is a strong relationship between these two. So, on the, on the psychological level of course, there are those cognitive developments that is happening stage by stage, but at the same time and at the social level, at the social plane also the child is constantly getting input from outside, outside world and this, this strengthens his cognitive development. So, according to Vygotsky's philosophy, language plays a cruci crucial role in shaping the overt behavior of an individual as well as influencing the covert behavior that is thinking. So, in fact, he talks about private speech uh, and then he says that private speech later on develops into what is it quite kind of goes underground and it becomes thought that is what is covert behavior. Overt behavior is the language output and the covert behavior is basically thought and he also talks about he gives various other kinds of um, uh, ideas also in terms of uh, JP, ZPD and scaffolding and so on and so forth. All these basically refer to the socio-cultural conditioning that the child goes through. So, uh, this, this is a very crucial, um, uh, crucial for skill development of a child which the child can use for developing higher mental functions on his own. So, this view expresses the idea that an individual's experiences form and shape the behavior of that particular uh, person. So, this is um, inner and private speech, uh, Vygotsky also gave an importance to, um, the, to, to, to the inner speech of the person, the private speech of a child and uh, he says that there is um, the transition between social and inner speech is very important and this private speech diminishes as the child grows gradually uh, after a period of time and then it kind of becomes his thought process. So, that it becomes the um, uh, inner, inner speech or the verbal thought. 
So, we have already seen that uh, within the within the constructivist theory there are many people, however, they all are not uh, they do not all talk about the same thing in the same way. Of course, largely there is a um, there is a common understanding that knowledge like uh, any other knowledge language also language learning is also a constructive uh, mechanism. It is the, the learner constructs the knowledge of language in terms of both psychological and social input. So, psychologically there are cognitive development sub stages and then the child actively interacts with the natural world as well as with the social world and in it is a, an interaction dynamic interaction between these uh, various inputs that the child constructs is his own understanding of a particular skill, the skill development whether it is language or otherwise. However, there are some finer nuances, some finer differences. Um, though they have been mentioned before, but uh, this uh, this gives you this uh, is a chart form that gives better um, uh, that that highlights those points. So biological maturation in terms of Piaget is what leads to cognitive development, but Vygotsky thinks society and cultural environment leads to cognitive development and so on. So there are many. Uh, of these things. Activity as far as Piaget is concerned should be individual, but Vygotsky stresses on the social activity that the child interacts with the other people in the environment with other you know socio cultural aspect of his environment not just himself and the natural environment and so on. Similarly, there are uh, differences between Sellers and Bandura uh, and so on. And then of course, there is uh, Jerome Brunner who again has given us a three stage developmental trajectory of children. So, in the first stage it is inactive stage which is psychomotor stage followed by iconic stage so when the visual imagery emerges and then the symb uh, symbolic stage that is when abstract image and language comes in. So, basically to summarize that there are um, of course, this is the list is not exhaustive here even uh, there are ma many more. Uh, scholars, Lenneberg for example, but roughly if we look at the um, uh, primary takeaway from these various theoretical standpoints, there is on the one hand the universal grammar, the proponents of universal grammar that says that believes that language is a task too demanding to acquire without specific innate equipment. So, there must be a language component in the brain which is enough. You know, it, it has to, there has to be because it is too complex a mechanism uh, without a dedicated uh, equipment for this. On the other hand, constructivists um, underline the importance of linguistic input along with general cognitive mechanism and social interactions. So, the, this is the primary difference between the two types of theories. However, let us not forget that Chomsky also agrees that the social environment, the linguistic environment is also important. It is not that it is not important at all, but he gives more importance to the, um, the mechanism that we are born with. But on the other hand, constructivists do not believe in, in an innate grammar. They believe that this is constructed, the child's language learning, the child's understanding of language and its usage and so on, all the different facets of a complex mechanism called language is constructed, actively constructed by the learner by these kind of various interactions. Now, yet another um, important aspect when you talk about language learning uh, in case of children is the notion that of, of critical period hypothesis. What is critical period? Critical period is basically a, a biological uh, thing, a biological notion that there is a very small temporal window in a uh, in the post natal uh, early post natal uh, life of biological entities where certain specific skill sets should be in place so, for example birds uh, the the chicks of birds must learn to fly at a particular within a particular short span of time after hatching similarly the hunters uh, the, um, uh, should also learn to hunt it at a very within a specific time. So, this is the critical period. So, this is a temporal time window in early postnatal life when specific experiences are crucial for the development of certain skills. And for many other um, less complex nervous systems like animals with less complex nervous system, behavioral repertoire like foraging, fighting strategies, etcetera are developed by intrinsic developmental mechanisms and are in place 
early. So, because these are innate mechanisms, it is understood that any innate mechanism. So, for, for a bird to fly is an innate mechanism, for a predator to be able to hunt is a is, a, is an instinct, it is innate. So, those innate capacities must be in place at a very early stage of life. This is what is what critical period is all about. And nervous systems of complex mechanisms or uh, complex animals like with uh, higher animals are influenced by particular circumstances. And these experiences are crucial for the development of those innate capacities. For example, birds in case of birds um, imprinting happen uh, in a severely restricted time window in early postnatal uh, post period, uh, period of life. In terms of humans, in case of humans because language is understood to be one of those innate capacities in uh, uh, like many other animals have. So, we have language as an innate capacity. So, it must also be following a particular critical period, uh, critical period of learning beyond which it is not possible. So, language learning because it is already uh, critical, um, innately guided, it is dependent on this time of type of time window and this is um, uh, this is what is so called critical period hypothesis, but it is slightly di more difficult in uh, case of humans to delimit as to what is exactly the time window. There is no pinpointed uh, time that we get, there is a, a lot of disagreements. Um, some, uh, some scholars agree that, uh, that the critical period for language learning ends at 10 years of age, some says pre puberty, so 12 years of age, and so on and so forth. But beyond, so it is there is a, but there is a time window uh, within which the children must be able to uh, uh, able to have the entire language skills in skill set in uh, in place. So, but is it really the case? How do we know that there is a critical period in terms of learning language for children? There were some cases of feral uh, children which have strengthened this idea of critical period hypothesis that if the children do not learn language within a particular specific point time window, they will never learn it. One of the most famous cases of famous feral children are that of Jeannie and Isabel. Jeannie of course, is not her real name in the story of Jeannie is very famous. Uh, it happened in 1970s, um, a severely abused uh, girl child uh, of, a, of an abusive father who was uh, who, who, who was um, who was brought up in a dark room without any human contact till she was 13. So, she was discovered at the age of 13. Um, so, she was already in the teenage uh, bracket and she had as a result of which as a result of the abusive upbringing, uh, she did not learn any language. So, nobody was allowed to talk to her and if she made any sound, any vocalization, she was beaten very uh, severely. So, after she was rescued, there were efforts to teach her language, to teach her to speak. And um, though she eventually learned some aspects of lang language, but she never ever mastered it. So, there are um, in fact, there are this case is has been so complicated that initially the the scientists were allowed to, 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 to work with her, but later on they were not allowed and so on. So, there are lots of controversies with respect to the claim that she even learned anything at all. But everybody agrees, all the scholars agree that even if she had learned the basics few words here and there, but she never was a proper like good speaker of the language English language. This was one case and she was discovered at 13 years of age. Now, there was another case of Isabel again an abusive upbringing uh, where she was uh, present in a dark room till the age of 7. So, her only human contact was her deaf and mute mother and as, as a result of which she had no language. So, when she was found it, she was thought to be uh, deaf and mute like her mother uh, because she could only make some so no noises and her, had an extremely low IQ and so on. So, her mental age was you know placed somewhere around one and a half years of age. However, after being rescued, she was uh, put through an intense amount of training and she later on caught up and learned to speak. So, the success of Isabel and the failure with respect to Jeannie actually have strengthened the critical period hypothesis to a large extent, because Jeannie was discovered after at 13. So, which is beyond the critical period of learning language, the critical uh, time window of learning language and Isabel was discovered before that. So, at age 7, so she could still be 
taught. So, this was these, this, uh, these instances uh, had strengthened the idea that there is in fact a critical time window within which language must be understood. So, uh, that is, so there is, uh, that means there is a certain amount of rigidity in the human brain with respect to language learning capacity. So, the, we also find out later on that language dependent on auditory vocal loop are found to be represented in particular cortical regions for all of us, auditory vocal loop as in when language is spoken and heard. The same cortical regions, same areas in the brain, same areas in the surface of the brain, in the, in the cortex of the brain um, are also found to be representing language for native speakers of sign language, American sign language. So, language not only the spoken language, the verbal language, but also the sign language are represented in a particular brain region, meaning that there is an abstract representation in the brain of language rather than the kind of language. So, this points to the fact that the left hemispheric specialization is a characteristic feature of language itself, language in its abstract form like what Chomsky said that there is an abstract form, there is an algorithm sort of thing that is there in the brain and not a byproduct of sensory motor factors. So, this is the brain, the rigidity of the brain structure that we are referring to. However, there is also a uh, you know, plethora of uh, data coming in from neuroscience, uh, neurosciences and neuropsychology, where we see that the brain is also capable of showing remarkable amount of plasticity. So, where do we find those? One of the most uh, uh, critical uh, proof of this was found um, uh, in, in the study by Sadato et al. 1996, where they found that blind individuals who are asked to discriminate braille dots have significantly higher blood flow compared to sighted controls in the visual cortex. What is happening here is that, that primary visual cortex is useful, it is the area, it is the brain area that processes visual information coming in through the visual uh, apparatus from our eyes. So, whatever information we get from our eyes is getting processed, uh, does get processed in the visual cortex. In case of blind individuals, that part of course, is not useful for the same kind of stimulus. So, what was happening in this particular case was that when those same, same the people who are um, uh, visually challenged were asked to uh, uh, discriminate braille dots, basically reading braille um, something in braille, those that particular experience the tactile in, uh, in, input, tactile sensory input was getting processed in the visual cortex. Now, how is it possible that the visual cortex which is not any more useful for visual uh, input is being used for tactile inputs? If the brain was rigid, if the brain regions are rigid, this could not be possible but this has been possible. This the study showed that this is the case. So, the visual cortex was getting activated by touch, which means the brain is plastic, brain uh, can show a lot of plasticity. In the domain of language, research has proved brain plasticity with regard to learning languages as well. So, there are many, many um, there is outputs, we will discuss only a few here. One of them is Talal et al's uh, study that shows that extensive training in rate modified speech and temporal discrimination to language learning impaired children resulted in them learning language. So, if you modify the rate of speech and the temporal segmentation, temporal discrimination, it is possible to teach children who are otherwise, um, you know, who are otherwise showing impairment in language learning. And that, uh, and she has uh, her 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 group uh, showed that this is possible even in case of children who have crossed the critical age of learning language, the critical period or time window. Similarly, there was another study that reported where a child had her damaged left hemisphere removed. Our left hemisphere, we speak with our left hemisphere, so to say. So the language areas are situated in the left hemisphere of our brain. Now, there was a child who had her left hemisphere was severely damaged and it had to be finally, surgically removed. The left hemisphere is removed. This child goes on to learn language at the age of 9 years, like after the age of 9 years that is that was that is that when the experiment, uh, the, the, the surgery happened. So, this suggests that 
See, when the left hemisphere, which is responsible for language learning, is removed entirely, which means that this child learned language with her right hemisphere, which is not the traditionally believed domain of brain that is responsible for learning language. So, if the brain is not, uh, you know, does is not capable of plasticity, this will not happen but it has already happened, the study has already proved that. So, this suggests that language can be can be learnt with the residual uh, abilities of the right hemisphere, if the inhibitory eff effects of damaged left hemisphere is removed, even at an advanced age in terms of um, uh, language learning ability, age 9 is quite late, because till then she had not learnt anything, because the left hemisphere was damaged. So, which means that inability to learn a new language at a later stage in life may be because of reasons other than critical period. So, there are some proof coming from this kind of various studies that show that it is possible, it is possible to learn language at a later stage of life and it is possible to master the language probably also. However, they may not be the, the reason may not be a critical period, reason may be somewhere else. In this case, in this child's case, it was the brain, uh, the damaged left hemisphere. In some other case, something else, which can be corrected, because the brain is remarkably plastic. It cannot be because the plasticity. Uh, we will discuss in the next, uh, in yet another segment in more detail, where we will see that brain is remarkably plastic. It has, it can adapt to a lot of um, demanding scenarios. So it is, it cannot be possible that language cannot be learned. It is another uh, skill set. It can be certainly learned. However, latest findings, um, but research in this domain is still going on and we have new evidence every other day that informs us about finer nuances in within this domain and let us some latest findings suggest that critical period may not hold for language learning as a whole, as in one will not be able to learn language at all, that kind of position is too strong to take. However, there might be some aspects of language, some grammatical aspects of language that might uh, get affected. So, um, it might, so ultimately critical period might hold, but only for certain grammatical aspects, what not language learning as a whole. So, within even within grammatical aspect, a smaller, uh, some smaller aspects of grammaticality that might get affected. So, this is about critical period hypothesis, which is a very important notion in terms of language learning. Another understand another uh, theoretical uh, standpoint with, with respect to uh, children's development, uh, because we are looking at language development, language line learning acquisition in children in terms of um, various other kinds of developments as well. It is almost in it is not possible to uh, differentiate that from other mental abilities. So, there is another notion called theory of mind. So, what is theory of mind? This is a very, very important socio cognitive, socio -cognitive skill. This is something, uh, this is at the, at the root of human behavior, at the root of human mental capacities and it involves developing a sense of what others are thinking. We automatically know by looking at another person, what he or she might be thinking and what we can predict the behavior of others and so on. So, this helps us form our responses in a given scenario. So, this is, this is um, theory of mind. So, this is not something we are born with. Humans are not born with the understanding that people have unique beliefs and thoughts. This is a learned behavior. In that in childhood, children do not know and very small children do not understand that what she is thinking is not the same as what another person is thinking. So, this is a learned behavior, hence theory of mind is learned. This stage is arrived at through various developmental stages that a child goes through. This includes the notion of attention, that is something we will bring up again and again, attention and intention of others as well as imitation of others uh, mental states. First stage is that of attention. Children learn very early that looking is not just seeing, but also a tool to be selectively used for to gathering information. In fact, remarkably, remarkable findings in this domain has come out that children who are very small like infants, uh, 4 to 6 months old infants understand that attention is a crucial. So, they know that how to uh, channel others attention as well. So, they know that looking is not just seeing, but also a tool that can be used for getting 
more information about that particular aspect in the scene. So, they have been found to be utilizing this mechanism to uh, in their uh, parents to get attention to themselves. As early as 7 to 9 months of age, children are capable of understanding attention in others the, the, and their, their behavior shows that the development of this social skill is an important predecessor to developing theory of mind TOM as we call them and uh, Simon Baron Cohen's contribution in this domain is immense. So, this is the beginning part. So, children start understanding that there is a mechanism of attention. They understand their own attention that they can actually get more information by paying attention to certain things. They can also modulate their parents attention towards themselves by using those skills. And this is on which the um, theory, later on theory of mind is built upon. This stage is followed by acting and knowing that people can act on uh, on that catches their attention. So, goal directed behavior starts from that particular aspect. This behavior is dependent upon intention. So, attention followed by action and intention and people can have various uh, different kinds of intentions and therefore, different behaviors. These are the components that gradually give rise to what we uh, understand as theory of mind. So, imitation is often understood to be another important aspect. Um, however, there are there are disagreements among among researchers on this. Children use pretend play. All of us have ch seen children playing, you uh, know, like kings and queens and teachers and students. Uh, so, pretend play is a very very important and integral aspect of children's development. This is this is the time that reflects that shows us that they have developed the understanding that different mental states are related to attributable to different characters. So, they know how a teacher will behave and how the teacher's behavioral output is depends on the intention and attentional mechanism of the teacher. So, the teacher understands things like this which is different from the student in the same given uh, bigger scene. So, by the time children are capable of pretend playing, we understand that, that they have the theory of mind in place. This is something that is uh, common and uh, taken for granted, however, this does not happen all the time. So, theory of mind refers to the ability to attribute mental states to oneself and to others. The idea that others have intents, beliefs, pretension, knowledge, etcetera and that these can be different from one's own. So, we have a mental state, another person has another mental state which includes all these attributes, pretension, belief, knowledge and so on. In normal population, this grows by the time the humans are about, human child is about 5 years of age. This is when they start the, uh, pretend playing. However, atypical population like children suffering from ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, etcetera are shown to have delayed development of this attribute. So, it entails what critical uh, what uh, theory of mind basically entails is that other people have thoughts, beliefs, etcetera. In short, that mind that can be different from our own. So, mental states there are differences in mental states as a result of which mental states because mental states cause behavior. So, this difference in mental states can also cause difference in behavior and once one understands that one can also um, predict the behavioral output in another person. This is not just human, this is not exclusively human, this is also found in many other primates, even birds and rodents. So, uh, we will look at the uh, some experimental details of uh, theory, theory of mind development in children in the next part. <laughs>